Good afternoon, Houston, Texas, for the Asteroid Initiative Ideas Synthesis Workshop. Over the next two and a half days, we will be talking about the 96 ideas selected from the overwhelming response to the request for information released for the Asteroid Initiative in June. This is an active conversation, and I encourage you all to watch on NASA TV or online at www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop. You can also follow us on Twitter with the hashtag NASA Asteroid, and we have specific hashtags for each of the breakout sessions, which you can find at the Asteroid Workshop website. First up to welcome us to Houston is Alan Ochoa, who is the center director at NASA's Johnson Space Center. Alan. Thank you. It's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, Ideas Synthesis Workshop for NASA's Asteroid Initiative. Uh, thank you all for joining us, whether you're here in person or virtually, to examine the responses that we've received to the request for information released in June. I hope those of you who joined us for the tour this morning found it interesting to see some of the facilities and activities we're working on here at Johnson Space Center to support the Asteroid Initiative. We're excited about this opportunity to share with you NASA's planning activities for the Asteroid Initiative and to obtain ideas from the broader community to improve the way the mission can be conducted. Your ideas and contributions to the discussions over the next couple of days will be important in developing the plans for the NASA budget request for fiscal year 15, both the Asteroid Redirect Mission and the Asteroid Grand Challenge. This workshop builds on an internal review that NASA recently completed of the technical and programmatic feasibility of the overall mission concept, as well as some trade studies and alternative mission options. It also builds on our more detailed discussion of the redirect mission at the AIAA Space 2013 conference earlier this month, where NASA shared details of the concept for the first time. Our concepts are still developing, so we're grateful for your time and energy to improve our NASA reference mission so that we can accomplish the goal of sending humans to an asteroid in the next decade. The Asteroid Redirect mission is an important step forward in building and demonstrating the capabilities and operational experience we need to safely send humans further into space and eventually to Mars. The mission advances human exploration by performing rendezvous, docking, and extravehicular activity operations in deep space as early as possible, laying the foundation for more ambitious missions to follow. It uses the initial capabilities of the space launch system and the Orion crew vehicle, which is well suited to execute the human portion of the mission in an affordable manner. A couple logistics notes. We're just down the street here from Johnson Space Center and we've brought over a few exhibits in the great room that will showcase some of the activities involved in an initiative. So I hope you'll find some time to visit them as you move between the sessions. And for those of you in Houston, uh, please let the staff of the Lunar Planetary Institute and our NASA team know if you need anything to make the workshop even more successful. And I would like to thank LPI for graciously agreeing to serve as our host for this event. And this is a good opportunity to congratulate the Orbital Sciences Corporation and our NASA team for their successful commercial cargo demonstration mission, which completed rendezvous approach, capture, and berthing to ISS yesterday. And we'd also like to congratulate SpaceX on their successful launch yesterday of the Falcon 9 version 1.1 1 .1, uh, from Vandenberg. As you can see, there's a lot going on at JSC and across the agency with both the International Space Station and our exploration activities. And now I'm pleased to introduce a short video from NASA Administrator Charlie Bolden to kick off the workshop, which will be followed by NASA Associate Administrator Robert Lightfoot's virtual presentation on both the Asteroid Redirect Mission and the Asteroid Grand Challenge. Thank you. Greetings. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you today, but I send my best wishes for what I know will be a very productive and informative workshop. It's a wonderful time to be involved in exploration, 
And this workshop is a prime example of what I'm talking about. We're actually making plans for humans to visit an asteroid and soon, Mars. That's very exciting. The work you do here to help us discuss the many fine ideas we received for identifying asteroids, developing the technologies to redirect one to lunar orbit, and then to visit it with astronauts is truly harnessing American innovation. You're helping us once again write history and do the things that are challenging but worth doing. I know we can reach our goals if we apply the best minds in the world to the big questions of how to reach higher, visit new destinations, and develop the technologies to do it. Our asteroid initiative comprises the mission to redirect an asteroid and the agency grand challenge to identify asteroids that might pose a threat to human populations and know what to do about them. It draws on the best of NASA across disciplines and directorates and builds on the many strategic investments we've been making since we began pursuing a new era of exploration after the space shuttle's retirement. Our space launch system rocket and the Orion crew capsule are making great progress to carry astronauts to new destinations, and many space technologies are in the pipeline to make their exploration missions possible. I know we're going to learn more about our solar system from this initiative, and we're going to make it possible to travel farther. I thank everyone who submitted ideas and everyone who traveled to be a part of this event or is participating virtually. Right now is a time of fresh initiatives that build on our depth of expertise and experience, and you all are part of it. Welcome, and I look forward to hearing about the outcomes of this very important meeting. NASA Associate Administrator, and he is going to give us uh, an overview of the Asteroid Initiative, which is made up of two parts, the Asteroid Redirect Mission and the Asteroid Grand Challenge. So Robert, over to you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear you. All right, good. Well, first of all, I'm very excited to get to this point. We've been talking about this, this workshop for a long time, and uh, it's... it's uh, very encouraging to see how many folks were interested and how many great ideas we had. Um, sorry I couldn't be there in person, much like Charlie, um, but we got a few things going on up here, so uh, it's it's uh, it's interesting to interesting times. Let's just say that. So I'm glad you guys are down there doing some real work and uh, and getting us to uh, get, getting the plans in place that we need to, to go do this 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 grand challenge and this mission. So what I thought I would do is I thought I'd take some time this morning or this afternoon to. Uh, walk everybody through where we are, um, kind of summarize where we've been um, over the past couple of months. Um, a lot of you may have heard pieces of this before, but we thought we could everybody start off on the same same point um, as you guys get ready to do your workshop and have all your all your uh, different uh, sessions for the next couple of days. Again, very excited about hearing hearing about these and, and, and uh, the, the 96 proposals and getting the information when you guys get, get it all wrapped up. So we could just go to the next chart. Um, if you look at the overall initiative, really we're, we're really trying to leverage all sorts of different forces of science, technology, and our human exploration capabilities. Um, as Ellen said in her opening remarks, I mean, this is, this is the first ever attempt for us to get people beyond Earth orbit and beyond the moon to a destination other than the surface of the moon. So this is a good chance for us to do that um, and, and really start advancing human exploration um, beyond the Earth orbit. And, and the asteroid will provide us that, that opportunity. So we're we really look at this as a, a technology demonstration mission as well for deep space exploration um, and, and, and the kind of systems that we're going to need in place down down the road for anything that we're going to do from a human exploration standpoint. Um, lots of other benefits with this as well. So we hope we, in just this workshop itself is allowing us to engage so many new partners and so many new folks in, into, this, into this initiative. So we also... Um, we're going to lead the broader efforts that the agency has about asteroid threats to human populations and, and, and what we could do about them, and we call that a grand challenge. Um, the mission itself and the grand challenge are, are, are 
two activities, but they very much overlap with each other, and we'll talk about that this morning or this afternoon as we go through this. And so I think you're going to see a lot of parallel um, activity, a lot of a lot of parallel development, and, and a lot of opportunity for partnerships, and that's why you guys are there uh, today. We go to the next chart. This kind of shows how we how we talk about two pieces within the agency. You've got the grand challenge, which is which is you know pretty much trying to engage the diverse stakeholders. You can't do a grand challenge without other in, in involvement in here as an agency. This is a, a you know a, a big thing for the for the government to look at. Look, look to it. it really requires the broad engagement, leveraging of all the activities that we're doing, whether it's public or private. So the grand challenge of, of, of you know planetary defense or protecting the Earth is a, is a is a, at, at the, you know, at the core of this activity. Our part of that in NASA is, of course, as I'm going to walk through today, is part of the asteroid mission and part of our ability to characterize and detect and, and do the things that we need to do. So this is kind of the what and the how. And, again, they're both leveraging capability that we have within the agency. Hit the next chart for me. So when you look at this, you can see, as I said a minute ago, that, that you've got different sources, different ways that, that bring everybody together, and we're looking for that high impact and that multidisciplinary collaboration um, that, that you guys all represent there. I mean, that's why everybody's there today, and, and including the ones online, and it's a good opportunity to get all the ideas on the table um, to, to, to attack this grand challenge that uh, we've been given. Next chart, slide five, please. So the image on the left is the meteor strike in Russia back in February. Um, it was caught by a dashboard cam. You know, this is this is one that injured over a thousand people and, and caused millions of dollars in damage. And, and it, I think the image on the right is kind of our our take of how we've got to go focus the five areas that we're focusing on for the grand challenge pieces. And the first is detect. The second is track, characterize, mitigate, and communicate what we're trying to do. So that kind of gives you. That kind of gives you a, a, an idea of the reality um, and an idea of what we're trying to do here. Next chart. So there's, there's several ways that we'll engage the public um, using this grand challenge. The, the first will be the public-private partnership activity. You can see the image of this is the proposed B612 mission um, to send an IR telescope into a Venus trailing orbit. We have an unfunded space actor agreement with them, and, and they're a nonprofit raising funds to launch and operate. Uh, their telescope. There's incentive incentive prizes. Uh, we've had the we've had the authority to use incentive prizes for a while now, and we we found them to be very successful in spurring innovation. Um, the picture is a is a Centennial Challenge for green green, green flight, and the cha challenge there was to fly 200 miles in less than two hours in the winter was did one of one uh, 1.3 million by flying over 400 miles. The third is crowdsourcing, and crowdsourcing is an approach you know where products and services and ideas are content are basically obtained by soliciting contributions from a larger group of people, and especially from an online community rather than from the traditional employers or suppliers. The, the images from the Galaxy Zoo effort uh, to identify galaxies using the crowd and collected 50 million classifications in its first year of uh, operation. And then the, the bottom right is citizen science. It's also known as crowd science or crowd source science, network science, um, and it's scientific research conducted in whole or part kind of by the amateur professional science is often crowdsourced or crowdfunded. Um, for the image under the balance bander there, this, this is Operation Moonwatch. Um, people are lined up at the entrance of a satellite demonstration set in Biloxi, Mississippi. Um, and, and, and the Moonwatch division of the Smithsonian Aeros Aeros Astrophysical Observatory was created in 56 as part of the satellite tracking program um, and established to track and photograph the artificial Earth satellites to be launched during the uh, International Geophysical Year in 57 and 58. So we think there's lots of opportunities here to uh, to engage others as, as we go in, into this grand challenge. And, and of course, based on some of the uh, submittals we've gotten, it looks like uh, that, that there are a lot of folks that do want to engage with us here. So let's switch now from the grand challenge to the mission. If you go to the next chart, chart seven, please. NASA, we're, what we're trying to do is align our, our kind of our Three of, our four, three of our four mission directors, the science and space technology and the human uh, exploration and op operations mission directors. And again, we're, we're, we're working to identify and characterize the efforts for targets. Um, we're looking at solar electric propulsion for transport to and from, um, to, to transport to the target and then bringing it back. 
looking at some of the autonomous guidance and navigation and control techniques we're going to need for proximity operations around around the uh, asteroid. And then we'll utilize, as we as Ellen and Charlie said earlier, um, we'll utilize Orion and Space Launch the Space Launch System to get our astronaut to the asteroid once we've returned it to the lunar orbit. Um, and then we've got the technologies that we're talking about for EVA, uh, extra vehicle activity that we'll need to uh, uh, come out of the Orion and then go into the go, go up to the asteroid to interact with it. Um, each individual activity, of course, is kind of important in its own right. We, you know, that's that's what that's what we find really compelling from our perspective. We're already working on all this. This is stuff that we're already doing as an agency, and this is a good way for us to integrate it around one common goal and one common. Um, activity. We're working to utilize all these activities and, and I think again we'll bring we'll bring the uh, a small asteroid into a stable orbit around around the moon um, and, and take our folks to it. And that's what the FI fourteen budget um, submit that we have on the hill right now was, was used to, to continue the advancement of all these. You go to chart eight for me. So these are kind of the three mission segments that we've talked about. You'll hear them quite often. It's, it's identify, redirect, and explore. So the first the first goal for us is going to be asteroid identification, um, and that's using ground and potentially space-based um, targets to detect, characterize, and select. Um, we'll redirect, as I said, using solar record propulsion um, and, and capture techniques that we're, that we're working on now and looking for information in this workshop from. We're, we're capture a, a, a asteroid and, and then bring it back to that orbit and then we'll send the crew out and we'll explore from there. You go to the next chart, I think Michelle, that's our our movie. If I'm not mistaken. Yes. And so if you can play that, you let me know when it's over so if I can't see it. Okay, it's starting. Okay, it's ended. <coughs> okay, so we should be um, to the chart, chart 11, which is the first steps to Mars and other destinations. Robert, we're on the second movie, sorry. Slide, slide 10.
Okay, slide 11. Okay, so our, our goal, I guess, here, and, and what you guys are helping us with is to turn those into reality. Uh, if you look at Charlie Island, which is kind of the, the first steps to, to Mars and other destinations, as you can see, we're, what we're trying to do is this is, a, this is somewhat of a stepping stone approach for us to, to take human, humans further and further out. And you can see the type of missions that we're talking about and then the type of things that this particular mission will allow us to go do. Um, in, in particular, it gets our solar electric propulsion uh, demonstration hopefully uh, successfully completed, gives us some good feel on, on deep space guidance and navigation, and gives us some crew ops beyond low Earth orbit. Um, it is different operating um, rather than 200 miles away, or, you know, operating further and further away, and, and, and the teams have worked really hard to kind of characterize that. And then the, the high entry, high entry, high speed entry um, is something we're working on. And of course, heavy lift, we've talked about that already. So that's what we hope to accomplish here in terms of getting these first steps uh, for human spaceflight beyond our orbit. We go to the next chart, um, which is our, we call it our swim lane chart. Um, this gives you an idea of the alignment strategy of the three segments, the, the identify, redirect, and explore segments. As you can see from the identification, the, 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 the accurate identification piece, you can see the type of things we're trying to do there, bringing things online, um, using the, the budget that we've got, plus any augmentation we get with our request from 14 to, to enhance these ground assets um, and get them up and running faster. Um, the asteroid redirect mission that you can see we're talking when we were talking about launching the, the mission for the demo and go out once we've once we've identified the one target. Um, and then if you look at the bottom, of course, that's our current path, current path we're on for uh, SLS and Orion and our, our big flights of uh, EF21 and uh, EM1 and EM2, which are going to EM2 being the first crew mission. So that's the overall picture. If you take the next chart, we kind of compress that a little bit and just give you the next. Um, next five years to kind of give you kind of give you some idea what we're trying to do here. And if you'll notice, if, if there was a we are here today kind of chart, it's the idea of synthesis piece where we really do hit all three of the swim lanes here with the with the type of work you guys are bringing forward um, to, to to see if we, see how that all feeds forward into the mission concept uh, baseline as as we and the robotic uh, spacecraft baseline. So. So this is what's important. You can see the different activities we've got, and we'll be we'll be populating this. You know, as we go through 14, there'll be other opportunities for us to have discussions as things as things come about. Um, but this is our current current path toward a uh, from a mission concept to a robotic spacecraft design that all feeds in, and you see out there in 2017 where they all kind of line up from a, from that perspective. So next chart, 14. So as you know, the, the RFI was released on uh, June 18th, and the responses were due a month later. And you can see the areas of request, and I believe there's a panel uh, a session for each one of these. Um, we received 402 responses, and, and of course you guys are all there uh, to explore the 96 highly rated responses. Um, I, I just got to tell you, we were, we were just thrilled with the response we got from everybody. Um, and it, it just, it's just it's, it's very encouraging to hear or to see some of these proposals and, and you know, now we have the hard job of going through them and, and working through how they would how they would fit in and what what elements of the mission that I just described is that or the grand challenge that they could actually uh, actually help us with. So I'm going to walk through some of the pieces now of this and show you where we are today um, and kind of where we're going. If you go to the chart 15, you know, NASA already has a, a near uh, object search program. This is kind of our current system as you see it. We've got. Uh, up at, at the University of Arizona and Hawaii and, and MIT, uh, where, where you can see the the, the activities that we're using, the, the Catalina Sky Server, Panstars, and Millennium. And these are all um, activities that, that you can see how many, what the percent is, and all the data correlation orbit determination is done, um, you know, by the Minor, Minor Planet Center. But we also have the folks at JPL that do kind of the precision orbital analysis, and they they're the ones that come in and really tell us. And so. We think the enhancements of these capabilities are what we're going to bring on the next two years, and they're going to help us define, um, you know, not only just not only the smaller candidates like we're looking for for this mission, but also the, the potentially hazardous asteroids as well. If you go to the next chart, I'll talk about some of those enhancements. Um, you know, we can, we're, going to, we're looking for some time on the DARPA Space Surveillance Telescope. Um, 
that telescope's now in testing, and, and we believe that we, we, we're going to demonstrate, or, or dem testing to demonstrate this month, um, the, the, the NEO detection capability. Of course, we're enhancing PANSTARS 1 and we're completing PANSTARS 2. These are, again, um, the simulate that just, just basically, uh, if we can start that time in, in 2014 and then late 2014 with PANSTARS 2 coming on board, the simulations we're running look like we just, just the, the um, discovery rate for PANSTARS 2 could be 100%. Um, with, with it at 100%, will be about five per year. So that's, that gives us some encouragement that we're going to have more candidates to, to look at it to figure out as we get ready to decide when we're going to go. You know, when we pick one that we're going to go to, um, we think we're going to have over the next couple of years several more candidates um, coming there. And then there's accelerated completion of Atlas. This is a small small set of telescopes. You see the, the, the picture on the right or the artist rendition on the right. Um, and and with, they have extremely wild with wide, wide field uh, views. Um, and, and, you know, every night um, we'll be able to we'll, we'll cover the entire night sky every night, but, but not quite as deeply as some of the others. So the final selection there will be early 2015. And, again, this is a case where we could, we could increase uh, even, even more up to, up to potentially 10. Now, that's, that's not 10 in addition. Sometimes there's overlap that they'll all pick up the same ones, but just, just to give you an idea where we are. Next chart, um, but it's not just about the, the observation piece, it's about the characterization piece as well. Um, and this is where our, our radars and our infrared facilities and then even the yeah, on-orbit assets that we have, can we redirect them. So we got the radars uh, at Goldstone and Arecibo. Um, we're looking for increased time for NEO observations. And then this streamlined rapid response capability. This is an important, important piece. We have to be able to identify them with the, with the assets I showed on the previous chart, get them to the radar so they can start the characterization process, and we got to be able to do that pretty quickly with the, when they're the small, the small uh, asteroids. And so that, we've been exercising that process already. You can see the uh, near infrared telescope facility. Um, that's another place that gives us, gives us we're going we're to improve the instrumentation there to, to allow us for better uh, spectroscopy and thermal signatures. And then we just reactivated uh, the, the NEOWISE, and we're in the warm-up phase for that to start it, to allow it to start on orbit, um, providing us um, the, the, the type of characterization we think we need. So that's what we're doing in the in the detect and characterize um, portion of this of that uh, of the effort. Next, we're going to talk about the uh, space technology piece um, and where space technology mission director is 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 engaged. From the most part, the, the big advantage here is that we that, that uh, the space technology team has been working really hard on their um, solar electric propulsion activity for a while, and, and several key pieces there, the solar array technology that they've been stressing for the last couple of years, is really going to be the is going to be the enabler here to get the, the solar electric propulsion up to what we need for this. So we're talking about that as the primary propulsion. Um, we were going to do a technology demonstration mission with that with that particular uh, propulsion capability at some point. Um, as part of the space technology program. So all we're really doing here is accelerating some pieces of that so that we can make this, uh, give the technology demonstration mission a, a good, a really good uh, mission to go do. So, um, again, it, it, as, as I've talked before, it, it is the, the component that they're developing here, especially in the solar array area, to get higher efficiency. So solar, higher efficiency and, and lighter solar arrays is a, is a big deal. So we think this is a, this is, the retrieval mission, or the redirect and retrieval mission, is going to be a really critical technology demonstration of the, the high power step. And you can see that we're talking about 30 kilowatts, 50 kilowatt solar arrays, the uh, 10 to 15 kilowatt uh, hull thrusters, and then the power, power processing unit, and then the xenon propellant tanks as well. So the next chart this gives you some kind of uh, some, some indication of a, of a uh, Reference robotic mission concept. This is this is the, just the robotic piece that is just going and, and retrieving the uh, asteroid and bringing it back. Very similar to the, the video you just showed. We have two options here. You can launch with an Atlas V, um, which is a low thrust pile for the moon, or you can use a SLS or Falcon Heavy. This is still part of our trade space that we're doing. And that allows you to, to do a direct launch, uh, which which can which means you can actually launch later, potentially to get to to get to a target one. Um, we'll then do the, the, the low thrust trajectory to the asteroid, then, then bring it back into the, uh, the Earth-Moon system and let the lunar 
when, it, when we get into the loop, bring it into the uh, the storage orbit is what we're calling it, which is the dis- distance retrograde orbit around the moon. And then seven, of course, is the is Orion uh, rendezvous anyway that as we go down there. So the next chart. We'll talk about the mission and flight system concept here, kind of an overall. This is the design reference mission we've been we've been looking at. Um, this gives you some idea, scale-wise, what it looks like. It's, it's really trying to minimize the, the cost and technology development risk. And you can see that, actually, the, the team led by Brian Muirhead and JPL folks has done a fantastic job of, of putting together a mission that utilizes a bunch of components that, that have, I would call, heritage with them from previous missions that, that, we, that we've used. And that's of course, immediately, uh, you know, knock down some of our development risk. Not that we don't have any, but it just it balances it pretty well across there. So you can see that we've balanced. You can get a feel for, for how this looks with the capture mechanism on top, the mission module, and then the set module. And you can see the Zenon tanks in there as well with the adapter at the bottom. So this is a very, very uh, feasible concept from what, what we've looked at um, from, a, from, from a mission uh, formulation review. And we're... We, we think this is a, a, a very doable um, uh, mission for us. If you go to the next chart, this gives you an idea of how we're, how we're going to capture that. As you can see, the, the capture mechanism that's currently proposed, the, the, I call it the design reference capture mechanism. We're going to, you, you kind of, you, you, you approach and you match the spin of the asteroid. And then once it's in the bag, you close the top, top piece and, uh, you know, we, we're looking at inflating some airbags with, with a very small pressure to limit loads. We don't want to disturb the asteroid per se, um, but it allows us to control it pretty quickly and uh, and control the loads on the solar arrays. That's one of the big challenges we have is the solar arrays on the uh, on the, the the robotic spacecraft itself. Uh, you don't want to. They, we have to we have to be very careful not to overload them. So that's kind of how it looks like as we move in there. At least that's the current uh, design reference mission. And again, we we expect to see some. Feedback in our in, in this workshop uh, on that. If you go to the next chart, it talks about our alternative approach, um, the robotic for the robotic concept. And this is this is to go to a much larger, um, you know, near Earth asteroid, um, hazardous size, but not necessarily a potentially hazardous asteroid, but still that that size. And it allows us to demonstrate that the, the planetary defense techniques um, in a little bit a little bit more obvious way to, to maybe alter the trajectory of it, and, and then pull off a, a, a boulder, I call it, you know, that's what I call it, pull it off of the surface of it, as we've, as we've seen um, in some of the other, some of the other uh, missions that have gone out to these, to these asteroids, you can see um, potential targets on, on the larger boulders that could bring back, and bring it back in the 20 to 25, 20, 20 to 25, 25 time frame. So this is just adding, I, what I would say is on the design reference mission, some of these were not mission objectives, but it's, it's a way for us to look at other ways to do this, and can we do this within the same um, the same dollars and the same portability and capture more more uh, more mission this way. So that's what we're looking at. Um, we'll have to identify how much time it's going to take us to do this and the kind of the kind of time time it had. So we when we did the mission formulation review, this one was a little. This is what I would call a uh, a follower. Kind of activity they weren't as far along as the uh, as the, the, the design reference mission, so they'll be back to see us um, probably around the end of November time frame and provide us more information on this alternative approach. If you go to the next chart, it gives you an idea of what kind of how we would how we would uh, deal with capture of, of taking a, 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 a potential target off of the surface of a of a larger asteroid. You can see we looked at several different ways to do that. Um, and again, same issues. We have a lot of the same issues, but we also have a lot of the same common hardware, depending on which one, which mission you're talking about. But a lot of the same issues associated with the, uh, the you know, loads on solar arrays and things like that that we'll have to do deal with as we get closer to the larger one. Okay. Um, now let's talk about the crew, crew portion of this. Um, if you go to chart 25, you can see, you know, one day I hope that is reality and we get to see that, that picture um, as the crew is going up to, to start pulling things off of the uh, asteroid to bring back for us um, as an agency. So if you go to chart 26, this gives you a pretty good idea of the trajectory and the uh, uh, the type of mission, <coughs> excuse me, the type of mission that we would be doing. Uh, the teams of Steve Stitch and his team have done a fantastic job, I think, laying this out. Um, and I think that you can, you can see we're talking roughly a, a, a 
26 day mission here um, with the time at the asteroid of five days and just gives you an idea this is a uh, uh, they've been uh, in my opinion a tremendous amount of work to get us to this point in terms of looking at what we would do and that even the abort scenarios and things like that along the way where, where could we abort how would we get out if we had a problem and, and all the activities associated with that but it gives you an idea what the and this is by the way I should have said this up front um, this is against the design reference mission was against uh, uh, an asteroid 20, 2009 BD which would be scheduled around the 2023 time frame not the 2021 time frame but we're still looking but we had to have one to go look at so this is this is what we're talking about here and of course the the mission duration and timing will change depending on where we where we end up. To go to the next chart, we've even gone so far as to start looking at the uh, stack attitudes, flight attitudes for thermal and lighting conditions. If we want to do the EVA, uh, so you can get a feel for how they've how they've looked at it. And if you look at the the picture on the right, you can see the crew um, um, coming up the side of the robotic spacecraft to get through the asteroid. Um, and so this is again good good work for us to do from a from a guidance navigation control perspective to get a feel for uh, how we operate as an integrated stack. Next chart just shows some of the um, example accommodations that we've talked about um, that, that the guys have already looked at in terms of the docking mechanisms, the vehicle-to-vehicle the, the -vehicle comm. Um, there's things that we will, you know, as we get closer, we'll make sure that the, the robotic space pad has so we don't have to take it with us. Um, targets, the power and data transfer, reflectors, and, and just status kind of activity that we need. If you go to the next chart, um, this gives you an example again of, of spacecraft accommodations for the crewed mission. You can see we've talked about tether points, translation booms. These are similar things you see us operate with um, on station today when the crew um, when the crew moves around uh, on the ISS. We're, we're using a lot of that. We even looked at the type of suits that we'll use um, from this perspective. Uh, next chart gives you the EVA concept, which is the, the you know, sort of Orion based EVA. We've got two crew, of course, in this activity. Um, and they do, two v, we, we'd be planning for two, v, two EVAs, uh, plus one contingency, and they'd be short duration um, activities. And some of the mission, mission specific kits that the, EV, that the Orion would have would be supportive of this repressed type capability for the Orion once we, once we get out there and, and, and everything else that we need. Next chart kind of gives you the, in my opinion, gives you the benefits of this asteroid initiative and the re redirect mission altogether. It really does uh, enhance our, our goals um, for human exploration. This is, this is, you know, this is a, this is a mission, um, not the mission for the agency. I mean, we're really trying to, to press, and this is a good mission along that way, much like ISS is today. The International Space Station is providing us those same kind of advantages, and we think we get benefits from this as well. Um, gives us a good good mission for the SLS and Orion initial capabilities to prove we can do those things with those activities and, and really kind of gets our, our uh, there's a complex set of ground operations and space operations that we have to do um, related to samples and sampling of small projects. It gives us, a, in my opinion, a, a fantastic opportunity here to show collaboration between human and robotic missions for exploration. I think too often we, we make it an or. Um, in the agency we make it a uh, human or robotic, and I think this is a great example of human and robotic and pulling them together. Definitely furthers our science and technology, especially in terms of the small bodies observation and characterization. Gets our, really gets the demonstration that we so 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 need and so want for future exploration of solar electric propulsion, um, and then works on the science, sample return activities um, as we move forward. And then, of course, the, the application for the commercial part is the Sandra Advanced Solar Electric Propulsion, um, which we know a lot of our commercial partners could use even in geo uh, orbit for combos and things like that. So if you go to the next chart, we'll talk about the benefits of the, the initiative as, as it relates to the Grand Challenge. And uh, this is, of course, you know, broad engagement with a bunch of folks. That's really what we want. Uh, well, a lot of people are there today in the next couple of days. And then it combines now a complement of open innovation techniques toward a single cause, public-private partnerships, the, the incentive prizes I talked about earlier, crowdsourcing, and then citizen science. We think there's a tremendous opportunity here to engage folks and to help us with this. Um, and, it, and it focuses attention on, on a global issue of, of, you know, the global problem of, of planetary defense and what are we going to do if one of these is ever coming at us. And, again, the key is to leverage the NASA activities we're doing, already doing, in a way that pulls them together in an integrated fashion, I think that really uh, 
really benefits um, not only the human exploration piece, but the grand, the grand, uh, the grand challenge piece as well. And so with that, I'm going to let you guys get to work and uh, start start dealing with all the pieces that are there. I, I do. I mean, I just can't express my my gratitude for everybody and for their input that they've had in this process. And, and really look for the team, the NASA teams that have been working this, the NASA teams that are or the NASA folks that are leading the, the workshops today. Um, you know, they, they they're just you guys are doing great. And then all the people that are there to participate, whether you're from academia, industry, or, or even other NASA folks, um, it, it, it's exciting to see the, the level of engagement that you guys have brought forward and really look forward to the results, look forward to sharing those with some of our stakeholders as we move forward uh, just to show what kind of uh, what kind of excitement we can generate um, with this community um, as we move forward. So best of luck, and uh, with that, um, I'll turn it back over to Michelle. Thank you, Robert. Robert, and uh, just uh, Robert's presentation is a reminder of how critical we consider virtual participation over the next two and a half days. So remember, you can follow on Twitter, you can ask questions uh, in the Ustream chat room, and you can find this all online at www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop. We will really want to hear from everybody out there uh, just as much as we want to hear from everybody here in the room. Uh, it's a great conversation, so um, please join us online as well as in here. And next up um, is Chris Moore, who is the Deputy Director of the Advanced Exploration Systems. Uh, he's part of the Human and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters. And Chris is our RFI guru. He is going to talk a little bit more about the request for information process and how we got to these 96 great ideas. Chris? Good afternoon, everyone. When we first started thinking about this asteroid initiative, we realized we were trying to do something extraordinary. Uh, for the first time in human s history, we were going to try to rearrange the solar system. And we can only imagine where this new capability may lead us. We also realized that protecting the Earth against the threat of asteroid collisions should involve everyone on the planet. Everyone has a stake in this. So we knew that we had to gather the best ideas from around the world to help us formulate our plans. So to get the conversation started, uh, we issued this request for information to gather uh, innovative ideas. So I'd like to tell you a little bit about the responses we received and the process we used to select the uh, ideas that are presented here at the workshop today. The RFI was released on June 18th and we requested information in six main areas, asteroid observation, uh, asteroid redirection systems, deflection demonstrations, capture systems, crude systems for asteroid exploration and partnerships and participatory engagement. The RFI was open to everyone, uh, to individuals and all types of organizations, and we received 402 responses. This is a breakdown of responses by the type of organization. And the surprising thing we learned was that we had really uh, captured the interest and imagination of the general public. You can see that about 40% of the responses uh, were from individuals who were not affiliated with any type of organization. Uh, we also received about uh, a quarter of the responses uh, from small businesses. And the remaining responses came from uh, universities, large corporations, uh, international organizations, and uh, the NASA centers. And this shows you a breakdown of the responses by the six areas in the RFI. And the area with the most ideas was asteroid deflection, uh, followed closely by asteroid observation. <laughs> 
we did receive responses from all over the world, uh, from 16 uh, different countries besides the U.S. So we were really uh, gratified to see the international responses. So how did we select uh, the ideas that would be discussed here today? We had a team of NASA reviewers who looked at all the responses and we evaluated them against four criteria. Uh, relevance to the RFI objectives, does the idea fit into one of those six areas uh, listed in the RFI? Uh, does the idea have substantial impact to ensuring mission success, accelerating uh, asteroid observations, and improving performance? Is it a really innovative idea and is it feasible? Our third factor was maturity. Uh, is the concept ready to be incorporated into mission plans or does it require a lot of technology development and is there a, an approach outlined for uh, reaching the required level of maturity? And finally, uh, we were interested in affordability and could the concept have the potential to significantly improve uh, mission affordability? So based on those factors, uh, we chose uh, 96 ideas out of the 400 responses. And the um, ideas are very rich uh, and very innovative. We did receive responses from all over the world. Uh, we're excited about the level of public participation. And you can see the abstracts of all the invited presentations on the web. Uh, under asteroid initiative on the NASA homepage. So that's just a brief uh, snapshot of the RFI responses and uh, we're glad all of you can be here today and help us with the discussion and this is just the beginning of many more discussions to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. And uh, next, also from the Human Exploration and Operations Mission Directorate at NASA headquarters, we have Michelle Gates. Michelle is leading the planning uh, effort for the Asteroid Redirect Mission. She's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the individual sessions that are gonna, going to start happening uh, at the conclusion of this plenary session and tell us a little bit more about exactly how they're going to work. Michelle? Thanks, Becky. <coughs> Just to note at first that we actually have a really great team. There's a lot of really good people involved in developing uh, the current concepts in preparation for FY14. Many of those folks are in the room, so I'd just like to thank uh, everyone um, and just reiterate and emphasize what Robert said as well. Um, the purpose of this workshop is to further examine and foster a broader discussion on the newest ideas which have come in through the RFI and further help inform our planning activities within NASA. <clears throat> so this week, the next two and a half days, we'll be listening, discussing, debating, and synthesizing these 96 uh, responses that will be presented at this workshop. The sessions are consistent with the RFI format, so each of the session leads is either um, has led the review of the RFIs, so there can be a discussion, they plan to actually discuss that uh, with you in their session. And there are two additional sessions on the Grand Challenge, which Jason Kessler and Jen Gostetic have added to the agenda. So we look forward to those conversations as well. Um, serving as leads for each session is a NASA um, personnel who served as either lead for concept studies or lead for the RFI reviews. We are really looking forward to your active participation and your thoughts and ideas. Um, as was stated earlier by Becky, each of the sessions will be streamed online. And so we'll be getting in virtual questions, um, questions virtually during the discussions. We have moderators assigned to each session as well as a session lead and co-lead. And so 
So the conversation will be in the room, very active, but also we're expecting to bring in the virtual component as well to try to get the best overall synthesis of these ideas bringing forward. The session leads have architected each session to encourage um, active Q&A. So in some cases, you'll see the Q&A portion um, concentrated at the end after all the briefings, and in other cases, you'll see Q&A um, after uh, topic areas which have um, collected RFI responses uh, briefed in each topic area. So, so please know that each session um, may be architected differently to try to bring out the best conversation in that RFI topic area. Uh, even though the seating is auditorium style, we're really looking for the open two-way conversation. It's auditorium style because of the seating capacity uh, here at this facility, which we wanted to be in this location and have this kind of conversation. So, so don't let that um, deter you. We really want to know what you think. We all have read all the RFIs already. We've already had our um, discussion about what we think of them, and so we're really looking for that broader input to bring in additional ideas and innovation um, into our thinking and planning. The session leads will all be out briefing on Wednesday morning, uh, and we've asked them to capture major discussion topics and a set of findings that will be out briefed, um, also uh, live streamed during that time. So the out briefing will also be um, public as well as uh, available for short discussion afterwards here in this room. <clears throat> Both the mission and the grand challenge will use the findings of this workshop in planning. We have, um, as Robert described, two mission concept development studies in process right now internally in NASA. We're also kick kicking off a um, robotic concept integration team to look across those studies as well as uh, the RFI synthesis and the ideas that come out of this workshop. And the Grand Challenge folks, Jason Kessler, has a um, implementation planning activity that uh, he's going to be discussing more with you this week as well. So briefly, just the request for these results of the session and what the chairs are being asked to brief on Wednesday morning is um, the agenda that you see on this package. Uh, but specifically for um, findings that are relevant towards the redirect mission, we're asking for a summary of the most promising ideas out of the discussion in each session, including innovativeness and the potential for improving mission system performance and affordability. We're also looking for any technology development that might be needed to mature the ideas so that they can be incorporated into mission and system uh, designs relationships, linkages, interface between ideas that could help us with mission and or system concept integration, and really a read on further potential further studies and next steps. That is a synthesis of the discussion in the session. For the Grand Challenge, Jason Kessler has asked for a summary of the most promising ideas and identification of overlap and synergy between ideas, and also prioritization of immediate actions. So please prioritize the list of next steps. <laughs> uh, that's all I have. And so now we're going to hear from our gracious hosts here at the Lunar and Planetary Institute. Steve Mackwell is the director of LPI, and he is going to tell you everything that you need to know to have a great next two and a half days. Steve. Thank you. I want to add my welcome to everybody to um, sunny Houston at the uh, tail end of the summer season. It's actually almost pleasant outside at the moment compared to what it has been. Uh, about 16 months ago, we had a similar sort of meeting here in the building, and that time it was in response to a NASA solicitation looking at near-term robotic and longer-term human exploration of Mars. Uh, that was a tremendously exciting meeting, um, very similar in structure to this, and many of the same aspects in terms of the opportunity for discussion, the opportunity for people to present their very clever and innovative ideas about uh, enabling exploration in its various forms. 
Um, I'm very much looking forward to the next couple of days and hearing similar sorts of things about our exploration activities towards an asteroid going forward um, and, uh, and seeing how this all kind of rolls out. NASA really took the results of the Mars um, meeting very seriously and it became part of the architecture for the Mars 2020 mission, which is planned for launch obviously in, uh, in 2020, um, but also took note of some of the very clever and somewhat um, off-the-wall ideas, many of them, for um, enabling human exploration in the 2030s. So uh, these meetings are tremendously valuable to NASA, we understand, and it's great that people are prepared to come and give their ideas and thoughts and input to NASA at this point. In terms of the logistics around here, there's not really much to say except um, the building here. Um, if there is a fire alarm, you will know about it. The alarm is not quiet. Um, there are doors at the back of the room. Don't use them unless you really have to because the alarm, that will set off a different alarm and you don't want to hear that one either. So mostly, if you do hear an, uh, a fire alarm, exit the building out through here, the doors just out here and go out into the parking lot where everybody will accumulate. Um, if you're in the rooms over there, you go out the, uh, the, the Hess room or the Berkners, you go out the front doors of the building and accumulate in the parking lot. We'll have the, the meeting staff, my meeting staff here, will make sure that everybody leaves and has a place to be. Hopefully none of that will happen. Um, people probably figured out where the bathrooms are already, but just in case you haven't, if you go down the hallway over there, past the Berkner and Hess rooms, you'll find them on the left. Um, so the main thing I, I really wanted to say is that um, my staff are here and I'm here to make this as good a meeting as you can possibly have. And if that means um, trying to find places for you to go and sit and have conversations and things like that, then we will do the best that we can to enable that. We want this to be a great meeting. We'll do whatever we can to help. So please, if you have questions or concerns, or just um, there's something we can do to help you um, within reason, um, then, um, then, then my staff will be sitting out here and will be able to help you. So thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. I know we're all very eager to get to the discussion. Our first two sessions begin uh, at the same time. They're concurrent sessions. They begin at 1.30 Central Time if you're here with us, and that's 2.30 Eastern. Uh, for those of you uh, watching on NASA TV or online at www.nasa.gov slash asteroid workshop, we will be back in a few minutes. Thank you. <laughs>